but still on the same source sheet. Um, so if you want to flip the page down to number 16, you'll uh, you'll see that. And yeah, we'll come back to Berkha Satara, God willing. Um, the clothing worn by the Kohanim in the Beis Hamikdash, ornate, beautiful, made out of gold fab- gold fibers or gold threads, I should say, um, purple wool. There's there's linen that's used. It's incredibly intricate. The clothing that the Kohanim wear. It had to be beautiful. It had to be measured precisely for the Kohanim. They couldn't wear something that was not fitting properly. If it got stained, they didn't clean it. Cohen wasn't allowed to clean it and wear it again. We had to get new ones. So what do you do with the worn-out clothing worn by the Kohanim? What happens to it, do you know? To decorate? Nope. Use it for light and menorah, according to the Yeah. Ah. So according to the source sheet, if you take a look at source number 16, the, uh, from the worn out pants of the Kohanim and from their belts, they removed threads and they lit the menorah. So you light the menorah using threads from the big day kahuna. That's what you're doing. Miriam, way to move the shear along. The, um, the problem that I have with this is a principle that the Gemara mentions in a variety of contexts. I brought you one example from the Gemara in Menachos. They're talking there about how you measure out the flour that you're going to need to use for a, uh, for a particular offering. I, I actually think it's better for me not to go through the specifics of source number 17, but to say it outside. The, um, the principle that they invoke is Ein Anius B'makom Ashirus. When you're dealing with the base Hamikdash, there can be no poverty in the place of wealth. The base Hamikdash has to exemplify that which is impressive. People can't go to the base Hamikdash and come away saying, eh, I was there, it wasn't so great. It's overblown. Like, you can do that with like a tourist site. Yeah, I went to the Grand Canyon. It's a hole in the ground. Fine. They, um, you can't say that about, um, about the Beis HaMikdash. The Beis HaMikdash has to wow everybody. And so we say, No poverty in a place of, uh, of wealth. That's why we don't repair or clean the, uh, the Big Day Kahuna, but instead we, we replace them. That's the whole point. So how is it that you're now not making you know, your wicks fresh? Right, you're you're you're, you know, taking them out of old clothing. I mean, doesn't that sound a little bit odd? The um, it's very strange, and in particular, it's strange when you're dealing with the menorah, because the menorah doesn't only need wicks; it also needs oil. What are the rules for the oil that we use in the menorah? For producing that oil? Shemen zayizach. Olive oil, pure olive oil. So, I don't know if anyone here has ever processed olives to make oil, but, the, uh, but there, there are a couple of things that you can do. No? Anybody? The, uh, Rabbi Metzger with our, with our Beit Midrash actually did an online demonstration um, last week, week before. But the, the, uh, there are two steps that you can take in order to get oil from olives beyond just like pressing it down. One is to crush the olives. Two is to cook the olives. Right? In both ways, you'll get more oil out of, the, uh, out of the olive. Neither of those is okay for the oil you want to use for the menorah. Instead, it's cold pressed. They don't crush the olive. Instead, they just press it and they do it cold. They don't heat it. You don't crush it because if you crush it, you're going to get debris from the olives in it. And you don't heat it because that is said to deteriorate the quality of the, uh, of the olive oil. So you're being so careful about the oil you're going to use for the menorah. But when it comes to the wick, it's just like, yeah, let's, we, we, we have this old pair of pants that a Kohen wore. Let's just take it apart and you know, make wicks out of it. So 
I think this actually goes back to something we said last week when we had our Hanukkah shir, the uh, the war on aristocracy. The to me the message of joining together the pure olive oil with the worn out wick um, is is the same message that you get from joining Yehuda with Dun and uh, and Naphtali, which is to say the um, it doesn't matter where you come from. What matters is what you're doing. It's a, meritoc- it's a meritocratic message. It's a message of anybody is able to become the star by becoming you know, the, the agent through which the menorah is, uh, is lit. And I think that message regarding Hanukkah is sharpened by Parshas Miketz. And it's really not just Miketz, but it's a flow of Parshios starting in Vayeshev and running all the way through Vayechi. Specifically, it's the Ark of Yehuda. Yehuda, you'll recall, is the fourth son of Leah. He's also the one who's supposed to produce the leading Shevet, Lo Yesur Shevet Mi Yehuda, Raglav. They're the ones who are going to produce the rulers, the leaders, and so on. But Yehuda has... Um, a, a uh, what's the word for it? I don't know. Call it a debacle, a disaster, um, a catastrophe in the sale of Yosef. The brothers are worried about Yosef. This is a family with a history in which each generation somebody gets chosen and somebody else loses. Right? Yitzchak was selected. Yishmael, you're not the heir got kicked out, actually. Yaakov gets selected. Esav, well, you'll get the bracha of living by the sword. Oh, and by the way, when your brother descends, then you're going to lord it over him. Along come the brothers, seeing Yosef having his dreams, and they say, oh, no, 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 this ain't happening to us. We're not, we're not, we're not doing what happened with Yitzchak and Yishmael. We're not doing what happened with Yaakov and Esau. We're not going to wait around for him to get the bracha and for us to be also rans. We're going to flip the script. So we're going to be the ones who are part of the family. And Yosef, who seems to want everything for himself, he's gone. And by Yomru Ish El Achiv, one brother says to the other, the Medrash tells us it's Shimon and Levi, says, let's kill him. We kill him? No problem. Kill him before he kills us. That's the, uh, that's the approach. Along comes Reuven, who doesn't want Yosef to die. And he says, I'm going to go get him. And the way I'm going to save him is I'm going to convince them not to actively kill him, but throw him in a pit. And then I'll come back later and I'll get him out of the pit. So he says, throw him in a pit. And everybody says, okay, let's throw him in the pit. And then along comes Yehuda once Yosef is already in the pit. And Yehuda says, He says, Really? We're going to kill him? That's a terrible idea. Then we don't make any money on it. That's it. He's gone. Better if we can make some money on it. Let's sell him. That's Yehuda's, um, that's Yehuda's approach. That's a terrible, awful scene. That's like, Really? You, you, it wasn't enough for you to kill your brother? Now you actually want to sell him into slavery? The, um, the, that's Yehuda at his low. And so we saw last week's parsha. Yehuda descended from among his brothers. He descended. He's now lowered. Not just lowered from leadership, but he is not worthy of being among the brothers. He's gone. We know the story. Right? He ends up marrying, he has kids, and then the whole thing with Tamar. And he is the one who has impregnated Tamar, and he finds out at the last minute, and his response is, Sadka, me many. She's right, it's from me. Or it's Sadka, me many. She is more righteous than I am. Either way, however you read those words. Yehuda not only stops when he realizes that he is the uh, he is the party and she's done nothing wrong but beyond that he doesn't just take care of it behind the scenes he comes out publicly and admits the children are his he takes responsibility 
And in that moment, he changes his narrative. So you get into Parshas Miketz. The brothers have already gone to Egypt once. They came back with food. But they were told, you don't get to come back unless you bring Binyamin. And Yaakov is never sending Binyamin. He's made that very clear. Binyamin, the last son left from Rachel, Yosef's brother, no way. He's not going. And Reuven tried to get him, saying, oh, come on, take him, you know, he can come with me, and if not, you can kill my two sons if something happens to him. And Yaakov says, really? And that's going to make me happy how? Yaakov is not impressed. And then up steps Yehuda, recognizing that they're starving, and he says, Anochi e'ervenu, I will be his guarantor. Miyadi tevakshenu, you can demand him from me. Why that satisfies Yaakov where Reuven's offer did not is not so clear to me, to be honest. I think that's its own sheer, the difference between Reuven's offer and, and Yehuda's offer. But the point is that Yehuda says, I am going to put my future on the line. I accept responsibility for whatever happens. I will protect Binyamin. And Yaakov hears something in Yehuda's offer and says, okay. And then, at the end of our parsha, Binyamin turns out to be a thief. Of course, we know he's not, because the Torah gives us what's going on behind the scenes. But I'm not so sure Yehuda has any awareness of this. All Yehuda knows, all the, all the brothers know, is that they, they open up the bags of all the brothers, and lo and behold, in Binyamin's bag is the goblet taken from the palace. So now, Yehuda is in this remarkable position. The brothers thought that Yosef was out to get them, and therefore they got rid of him. Now, Binyamin is a thief, endangering everybody. What's he going to do? And Yehuda says to the Viceroy, beginning of Parshas Vayigash, it's on me. It's on me. I will be a slave in his place. Take me instead. And in so doing, Yehuda finally corrects his wrong from the sale of Yosef. He steps up. He goes he grows beyond his past. If you take a look in source number 18 on the sheet, the Medrash and Barashis Rabbah, on the bracha that Yaakov gives to Yehuda in Parshas Vayechi, Gur Arye Yehuda, right? He calls him a young lion. Melamed shenastan lo gevura shel ari v'chutzpa shel gurav. He gave, Yaakov gave to Yehuda the strength of the lion and the chutzpah, there's no other word for that, the, uh, of, uh, of a young lion. Miteref beni alisa. So there are different ways you can read that line. But the way it's read with the trop is miteref, pause, beni alisa. Teref, what, is, what does the word teref mean? Torn. Sorry? Torn or ripped. Torn or ripped, correct. Tearing, ripping, right, that's exactly it. That's where the word trefa comes from. An animal is a trefa. So, from miteref, from the tearing, you arose, my son. What tearing? Mitirpo shall Yosef alisa venis alisa. From the tearing of Yosef, you rose. The Medrash seems to assume that Yaakov knows what happened at this point. Yaakov actually knows the story. And there's a lot of evidence for that. But... Be, you, know, you rose after what happened with Yosef, mitirpo shal tamar alisa venis alisa. And from the tearing that happened with Tamar, you rose as well. He was in Terev. He was, he, he messed up. He, he disqualified himself. But then he came back from it. That's what we learned from Yehuda's Ark. And to me, linking that back to the Wicks, you know, the message is, the message of the wick is that it's our privilege to be able to take responsibility, no matter what our origin is, no matter what our personal level is. And the message of Yehuda is that it's our obligation to do so, to take that responsibility, to play that role. Now, the truth of the matter is, if this was more than a brief to our Torah, I would argue the other side also, which is sometimes you take responsibility and it's actually a mistake. If you think of the Chashmonaim and how they became Hellenized after the events of Hanukkah, right? They took leadership roles that were inappropriate for them. They became kings instead of remaining as Kalanim, blending the political and religious leadership. Like there are limits. Sometimes you make a mistake when you try to do that. But the message, nonetheless, here, the message that we get from from the Wicks and from Yehuda, 
is the uh, is that that we do have a responsibility to step up. And so I would say, just to conclude this, um, on Hanukkah, we make a very big deal about the discovery of a vial of pure oil. And that's fine. Let the oil have its spotlight, so to speak. But we also celebrate linking the pure oil with a worn out rag. Right? It's not only about the oil. If you don't have the wick, there's no menorah. The, um, the, the linking of the Torah that is the oil and the mitzvot that are the oil with the Jew who is the wick is what creates the light of eight days. You follow? So that's my idea.